It's not what or how we teach children that determines what sort of adult they become. It's how we treat children. Children are actually born natural learners and that we kind of destroy that learning with too much control. But the more we can free that up, that to me is, is the hope for education. Who are you, Patrick Ferenka? First question. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a educator and a writer who specializes in homeschooling, as most people know it, but uh, as the founder of my company termed it, unschooling, meaning not doing school like your home at all. Okay, tell me some more stuff about you, like your, your education, or what are you doing sure. now currently with your life, kids, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I uh, graduated uh, uh, college in the, well, graduate school in 1981 and couldn't get a job as a teacher because there were firing teachers around Massachusetts then, budget issues. And I wound up uh, working in a bookstore, and this guy named John Holt started the company, uh, Growing Without Schooling, and Holt Associates uh, was a patron there. And I eventually uh, volunteered at his office, and uh, as open as uh, he started a magazine called Growing Without Schooling in 1977. And when I joined in 1981, it was really growing. We went from zero subscribers to close to 2,000 at that point. And um, I think actually it was... What, what, what do you mean subscribers? They were paying money to... Yeah, uh, the magazine was called Growing Without Schooling. Now, John was uh, a private school teacher, and he wrote a book back in 1964 called How Children Fail. It's still in print. And that book made him very famous. Um, and his second book, How Children Learn, um, he came, made him even more famous. That came out in 1967. Both books are still in print. In fact, here's a, an Italian translation that just came out this week of how children learn. So you could see uh, his ideas are popular still, but, you know, educators didn't like him because he was saying that you got to stop writing the backs of children. And, and let them learn on their own more, give them more independence in the classroom. And he was trying to do that. In, in, and that's in how children fail and how children learn. He, he gave many examples of how that would work and how in his own classes, uh, what he noticed was the, you know, the less frequently tested children, the more they learn and re retain what they learn. Uh, cause what, uh, as he wrote in the first book, the only difference between a good student and a bad student is the good student is careful not to forget what they study until after the test. And Holt bore that out because he and his colleagues would give the test on Friday, then give the same test on Monday, and they couldn't remember. Half the class couldn't, couldn't score where they were on Friday. And we know that, that, that from our own lives. I mean, how many of us have taken classes that we passed that don't remember anything? I mean, I barely remember algebra and foreign languages. I mean, we have, we're, we have to study foreign languages in America. I've asked French and Spanish. I wouldn't dare try to speak French or French, so French or Spanish, you know, uh, but I passed. So it was what, what John called a charade of learning. We pretend we're learning. We pretend you're, you're, you're teaching. I get pain. You get promoted. Let's go on with life. And this is, you know, school as it, as it was. And unfortunately, it hasn't changed very much since the 1960s. So uh, John uh, said, look, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's and he felt that there's true of private schools, too. So he, he didn't he just termed them soft jails and the public schools, hard jails. <laughs> so uh, he was trying to figure out ways that that you know, we could let children learn in the real world, that they could play games that they organize and aren't like structured and planned by adults to um, you know, break and, and find like the stars. And, um, eventually John just realized he wrote a book called Instead of Education that outlined all of this, uh, how it could happen in alternative schools that were doing such things. But, um, at the end of that book, he calls for an underground railroad to help children escape the, the dangerous, uh, consequences of being in a, in a place that doesn't respect you and that just, you know, uh, it, is really helping you learn what, what you need to learn. Um, it, it, it's what the school needs you to learn. 
You sound like, you know, not, not what you need to learn at this, any particular point in your life. And uh, so John uh, called for an underground railroad to get kids out. And uh, people started to write him after that book, Instead of Education, came out. Its subtitle is Ways to Help People help people do things better. It's like, you know, that's what schools should be. How to help you do things better, not how to rank you so I'm a, a, you know, a janitor or a CEO, you know, or, and, and so, some so, uh, go ahead. John Holt was the, wh why he was the first person to go against the school system publicly back then? Like, uh, yeah. Or well, other people did, and why why he was different in that regard? Well, the the main reason um, it was different is because he didn't appeal to the education establishment anymore to try and fix the schools. He just said it's a, a bureaucratic nightmare, a political nightmare, and no one really wants to talk about education. It's all about scoring points in the culture of war or the, you know, whatever political issues are at the time. So, but let's just figure out how children learn. So when he called for this underground railroad, uh, people started writing saying, Oh, John, you don't need an underground railroad. You can teach your own children. And then he found out that there were people like doing, you know, not sending their kids to school and yet, yet the kids were learning and doing well. And he wanted to find out more about this. And so, uh, once he did, he started the magazine growing without schooling in 1977. And it was just largely letters that people would write to John. The internet didn't exist at all. <laughs> and, uh, and it would write to the magazine and we would publish them. And, um, John, uh, I came in in 1981. As I said, it was growing. Uh, I went from a volunteer to becoming an ad manager and eventually as business manager and uh, managing editor of the magazine. Um, and, and, and it kept growing. And then when John died on um, the 19th, how, how much was, how much was the fee to be a subscriber? Oh, a I think it was in those days, $12, 10 or $12 for a year. You know, it was about six issues. When it first got published, you could see this in the original issues. He said, we'll just publish it when we have enough material. <laughs> you know, but eventually we had enough material that we could get on a schedule, you know, and even, even attract some advertising. But, you know, it's always a very small thing. And when John died in 1985, um, I took over the company and I published the magazine until 2001. And, you know, we grew the subscriptions in, um, in the face of, of unschoolers. And, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's counterintuitive because, you know, education is so, so tightly entwined with the business of education, you know, that, you know, saying, telling people, you don't have to follow the school curriculum, you know, so what if your kid doesn't learn to read until they're in, in you know, fourth grade or they learn to read early? I mean, there are letters in the magazine teachers who were annoyed that kids would show up in first grade and already know how to read because that meant there was, you know, they were disruptive in the class because they already knew what to go on. So, you know, trying to figure out like different ways of changing the classroom, you know, to accommodate the individual uh, learning styles and interests and issues. You know, I mean, John was the first one make that look like it's the emotions of a child that matter how much they can learn to, you know, but none of that's taken into consideration. In school, you know, we just, you know, you, sh you show up, and even today in 2023, it's pretty much the same thing. You show up, you sit down and run through the material. The pandemic showed us that in spades as parents were watching their kids learn with the teacher right. through the computer and say, so if this is what goes on, only there's no computer interface between us. <laughs> right? So I, I think that more and more, you know, people are becoming aware that the idea that we can, should control how children learn from birth until they graduate school is not the best way, you know, because when children are born, they start to learn immediately in the world. They have a natural interest and we tend to, to quash that. I, I've been talking too much now. I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask some questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is, this is what it's about for you to talk and share your ideas. Uh, but I want to close that uh, window that we left is uh so what you learn personally uh from john holt as a person 
And is John Holt the reason you are in this business? Uh, that you, you t maybe want to, uh, I don't know, continue his legacy or uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, well, for me, I, I had, um, I was a, I was a good student, you know, I was not disruptive, you know, I was class treasurer in, in seventh grade or sixth grade, something like that. You know? But by the time I graduated eighth grade, when we had to choose where to go to high school, I remember vividly being so bored with school. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, is this all there is? I read a book and take a test. Is that it? And I was so upset by that. You know, my, my dad, uh, was where he, his office was in the Bronx. We, we had moved from the Bronx in New York to, uh, White Plains, New York. And I was going to grammar school, White Plains. And dad said, well, you know, you can come, uh, there's a high school down by me called Fordham Prep and they have a, uh, an alternative school program. Maybe you'd be interested in that. So I went down and sure enough, the school, like they, you got to, to work with a major every day, choose your own classes. Um, and, and to me, it was exactly what I wanted. And, and I was so pleased that, you know, the adults treated you with respect. You know, it was a prep school, so you had to wear a jacket and a tie, but they called you Mr. Ferenga and, you know, and, and they spoke to you as an adult, not, not like a, a little kid who doesn't know anything. And, um, and so I was really, really attracted to that in the school. I, and, and they, they had like very experimental offerings. Like once a month in my freshman year, they had a thing called X Day. And each department would put on a special event, like the science department showed a movie about, uh, nuclear war that was popular at the time. I forget its title. I mean, we'll go back to 1871, you know, but, um, and I, re I remember that because it, it was a, it was a great, it was a very good movie. And then the music department, uh, Mr. Johnson on, he was one of my favorites. And, uh, he did, he did an incredible work, uh, introducing us to jazz and, um, non traditional music, you know. So I really, really felt it. But then, of course, the backlash happens, right? So by the time I was a senior, um, actually, I, I think it had happened the year before I became a uh, senior in high school. A, a kid, uh, there was a backlash against the whole program because someone died of a drug overdose. Uh, it, wasn't a, it was a class ahead of me. And, you know, and needless to say, the conservatives, you know, who control most of the power and money in the school. You know, just said, oh yeah, there's all because of this liberal, uh, whole, you know, program that you have, you know, and so it's become that whole point. By the time I, 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 you know, within four years, the Fordham prep plan, as it was known, was gone and it had just gone back to becoming a classic Jesuit high school, you know, teaching, teaching the, the standard curriculum of for prep school. Do, do you standard. know why it, why it failed? Like it, it didn't fail. I mean, it failed for me because that became the sort of school that I was already bored with. But for them, I mean, they're, they're still doing great. You know, they have tons of students who go away. I mean, uh, you know, this is the thing. I mean, you know, people, people like to see their kids controlled. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but then, uh, and then I went to graduate school and, you know, thought I'd become a teacher. And, uh, when I got out, I couldn't find teaching jobs. So I wound up working in a bookstore and, um, you know, from, and, and then when I learned about John Holtz, uh, I, I could learn this thing called word processing. Back then it was just a machine called the word processor. It wasn't the program that you put in. And, uh, Holtz had the Alavetti's and the Wang word processors were really big then. Um, yeah, I'd rather oh my God, Wang. you are, you are. You are old. I am. I am ancient. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my, my three daughters. Uh, yeah, we unschooled them. They're all. They're all. Uh, what? Thirty-seven, thirty-four, and thirty now. So yeah, I'm. I'm up. I, I've been through the mill on this. But you know, uh, when I you were asking me about about uh, you know why why I was attracted to these ideas of John's, and that's because it made so much sense to me. Because I was that child that learned everything for the test and then forgot it. Yeah, you know, I struggled through math, but I got through. And then, you know, I wound up doing double entry, book, learning double entry bookkeeping and, and, and Holt Associates. I, and that was needed. The bookkeeper was quitting. So she taught me, like, I didn't need to go to college to learn how to do bookkeeping. 
And I didn't, and you know, and I realized that it, I didn't need, need like advanced math skills. Just basic math skills got me through this. And I sort of realized, like, boy, the pressure that that you know, and all the expectations, like, oh, you know, you know, they say, like, what do you want to be? They say, oh, uh, this is an example from a uh, the book uh, teach your own that that, that I, I call with John. Um, you know, uh, a kid who said he wanted she she wanted to uh, work with. Uh, fish in uh, marine life and so the dad said oh you've got to become a marine biologist and you know so you need this course and that will set you up and you know my friend grace llewellyn uh wrote in about about this because you know, i said it, it was there was, was a magazine so people just respond to these letters every month and and grace said you know there are other ways of working with that fish you know i mean you could study whale songs you could you know join the Cousteau society you can, you can, you know, help clean up coral reefs and, and rivers. You know, there's a hundred different ways you can do it and, and participate and actually start now as a young person rather than wait until you got through, through, uh, college and then find out that maybe I don't really like marine biology that much. <laughs> you know, that's happened to so many lawyers and, and other people, you know, uh, you know, but once you're locked in, you know, to, to those degrees, you know, some of them take a lot of years and, and expense. You're not going to give them up, even though you, you no longer like them. And we've all experienced that with, like, you know, teachers or you know, or just so dissatisfied with their job. You know, and who can blame them? It's a very difficult and paid job. But um, and, and and that's why one of the things that that you know really upset Holt. He said teachers should be the bosses of their own classrooms. And I think he'd be having a fit watching like uh, the riots that are going on in, in, in Florida and uh, other states in America where, you know, parents are actually like, you know, completely, you know, overruling teachers and everything saying, okay, I know what my child uh, should learn and it isn't that. And, you know, that's why you can homeschool. If you don't like what's being done there, then you should homeschool or go to private school. But that, that's another issue altogether. That's that's really unique to America, I'm afraid, at this time. So the reason you are attracted to the phrase to John Holt ideas is because it, it connected a lot of dots in your life. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, he wrote, uh, before he died, he wrote a letter to, to a friend in Ohio State University, published his uh, collection of his letters. And, and this is one of them. And then he said, you know, what I want is a life worth living and work worth doing for children and indeed all people, not just something called a better education. You know, we, we have this idea we, we, that, that we have to be educated before we can, can work, but it's like, no, we should be learning throughout our lives. Yeah, you know, we should, you know, so, you know, why should it, why should it take, you know, we think that we're a Swiss Army knife the minute we, we get out of college and get to, to whatever job or, or slot it because of our degrees to do. You know, John is, he was like, let's try out different things and, and, and yeah, and let's involve children at, at work. You know, um, it, he was talking about in teacher training schools, they should, uh, pair, uh, young, young students, uh, students, uh, in graduate school with parents who have newborns so that they could see firsthand how children learn before they, get all wrapped up into this idea that the only way they're going to learn is if you sit in the desk and some instruction. So we should close schools. Schools have hope to become a place no. of learning. Well, John, you see, John felt, and he wrote about this in the very first issue of Coin Without Schooling magazine, that he's tired of, he he considers himself a citizen, as do I. And I don't want to, you know, see the schools disappear. I, I hope that they would change because people work. We're in a society, a society that doesn't care very much for children. You know, we want them locked up <laughs> in the school there while we work, and then we'll take care of them while they do their homework. And, you know, like my my prep schools, like, oh, three hours of homework a day, a night, three hours a night. Imagine that, you know. And, 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 and so, so school, you know, most parents are happy with that. And John acknowledged that I get it, you know, okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to revolutionize and revolutionize the schools, I'm trying to show them different ways and show parents different ways. So yeah, um, you know, find, you know, f 
finding ways, to, you know, and Chad wrote about that in his book, Instead of Education, he talks about like different alternative schools. And, and I, I often mention summer camps and, um, and, and, um, uh, experiential learning, travel. I mean, these are all different things that, that are, you know, tend to just be used for super wealthy or privileged children or kids that or somehow got nominated into a special program. But this is the way we've learned throughout all our lives, having access to adults and work in society. You know? Uh, but you're not answering 100% my question, I think. Okay. So you think uh, schools needs to fundamentally change? Uh, to And how do they change to fit this theory that you're saying? Should well, we... Uh, I think uh, let me give you a, a personal example. I think I think you know this would be a very you know it, it's not that hard except for our, our attitudes. Um, my daughter, when we were unschooling our daughter Allison, my, my middle daughter, she wanted to learn Spanish, and um, neither one of us was particularly good at Spanish. Um, and so my wife uh, and I went back to the school. A local school, literally around our corner. And I'm looking at it now. <laughs> this we can go over here. And, um, it was a great, it's a grammar school, grades, uh, you know, one to four or five, I think. Um, and the principal, uh, was very amenable. He says, sure, your daughter could take Spanish here. You pay taxes. She's a student here. Why not? You know, so Alice would walk into the school, the, the Spanish class, she, nothing special. She, she attended the class as it was scheduled. With the other students who were supposed to be there, she just walked in the principal's office, sign in, goes to the class, comes out, signs out from the principal's office, and came back home. It can be as simple as that, you know. But you know, we're, we've now we've created like these huge magnet schools, and um, you know, everyone's got to be bust somewhere, you know. The whole idea of of a, of a community, uh, you know. It's still, it's still, it, it's there, but we've, we've sort of said that the school is the most important community rather than the community of citizens outside, you know, and that we all have to support the school. And so that's fine, you know, but then share the school. But, you know, the, you know, and I'm so glad that the principal of, of that school, um, I think his name is Mr. Swanson. I don't know where he is now, but, you know, he, he allowed it. But I got to tell you, a lot of schools refuse that. A lot of schools absolutely refuse to cooperate with homeschoolers in any way. You know, it's like you're out, you know, and, and part of the reason is, you know, as one more than one educator saw me is because our, the school's funding is based on the number of students enrolled that year. And so you're not counted as enrolled if you homeschool. So you're, you know, so yeah, your tax dollars go to what they call the general state fund instead of to your local school in that instance. So technically the school is, you know, not, you know, making money or being, you know, reimbursed for the time that your child is there. And that's, that's a political fix that, that could easily be, be, be fixed, you know? Um, but the, the, the political will is not there. And so that, you know, and, and when I got started, I think it was less than, 2% of the population was homeschooling. Now, since the pandemic, I've seen, I, I think it's closer to 4%, but I've seen numbers as high as 11% of, of people are homeschooling. So, you know, I, I, I think schools would be wise. In fact, John wrote a great essay called Schools and Homeschoolers, a Fruitful Partnership, because they would learn so much about other ways that they could help kids learn, you know, why don't you want their kids to go to conventional schools? That's fine. My daughter wanted to go to a conventional school for Spanish. Why not? But, you know, not everyone wants their kid in school all day. I mean, one of the reasons unschooling is popular with, with some people is because they enjoy being with their children, watching and helping them learn, and don't want to give that pleasure up to others. You know, that was one of the, the great, great things uh, uh, that, that we experience in as parents, you know, and then sharing that with other parents. You know, uh, I ran, you know, everyone shares their skills as best they can because the schools are, are, are awarding them to a large degree. So, you know, my wife would teach math. Um, uh, another mom, you know, who was a uh, skill and she was a skill teacher, um, uh, stopped teaching to homeschool kids. She, 
saw a literature class. I taught stage and parlor magic. I do sleight of hand. I've been doing that ever since I was a kid. Um, you know, and, you know, we put on plays, we rent theaters and the homeschoolers would, you know, would write the plays and, and stuff. I mean, th- there are all sorts of ways that, that we're kind of like running in parallel to the school, you know, but we, you know, we were just, it, it, it was very organic. It just, you know, formed up, like I no longer do the magic club. You know, I'm not aware of the puddle jump players, you know, doing, doing their homeschooling plays anymore, but, um, there, there's a lot more going on. You know, I mean, a lot of us got sucked into the computer world. You know, um, you know there's a lot of opportunities there, but I, I think that children learn best by socializing. Yes, the irony is old schooling is often said, oh, you're, you're against kids, you know, meeting people, you want to isolate them. It's like, well, I mean, that's probably the biggest complaint old school children make is that they don't have enough friends. So going out and making those connections, meeting other people, you're modeling that behavior for your children by then seeing you introduce yourself to another family and you know, see if you meet them in the park or at, at, you know, a soccer game or something. And, you know, that's important. And that's how these, these relationships, uh, you know, come about. Um, a, a, a real brief, brief one. Um, my, one of my daughters, my oldest daughter, wanted, wanted to learn about anatomy. And, um, you know, Maureen, the lady who ran literature courses, oh, well, one of my students' dads is a chiropractor. Maybe he'd be willing to do that. And he was. So he had them come to their office, his office after hours and showed him the skeletons and stuff and described, you know, I think it was just like two weeks, you know, but it made a very big effect on my daughter. You know, she, or she really got, got into it. And, um, so, so there are a lot of ways, you know, and it doesn't have to, she, that was only a two week thing to get it grew organically out of this. And it, but it, it, it stuck. It's possible for these things to happen. And I see it happen all the time. I've got, um, I'm working on the fifth volume of Grow Without School magazine coming out. We have so many stories like this, you know, that it, it's amazing. I can't wait to, to just have that whole project finished because, you know, it's 21 years of, of publication, you know, and these are all real stories of real families. You know, some of their kids get into Harvard, they become scientists and whatnot. Others go off to become carpenters and farmers. You know, it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, you know, this idea that, that progress can only be made by putting kids in an institution that is, you know, geared towards producing uh, scientists and, and the workers of tomorrow, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, the, the way colleges in America now present themselves, like everyone is going to become a leader who changes the world just by attending the school. It's like, what about just like finding me a good job when I graduate? <laughs> That's all I want, you know. And homeschoolers often have a leg up in that because they've got more work experience my you know my, my children when they were you know well that we don't have a problem with them helping out with chores around the house and and, and doing work um like i mean working in a restaurant or uh you know i'm trying to think about the jobs that they've had with you know, large new restaurant work with them you know but all that stuff helps you know and, and is educational and you know you want to learn math Try and figure out your tip. <laughs> the bill. That's <laughs> that's a motor. So do, do do you think think homeschool increase on average the chances of success of the child? Well, I personally do because I I, I, I judge success also from the point of view of is is this a person who is happy and comfortable in their life? Right. It's not just, are you a successful lawyer, you know, or, or, uh, a, a big name entertainer, you know, um, those, those are the, the images and, and the desires that, you know, the, the culture puts out to us. But the reality is most of us, you know, work day to day and, and actually change jobs several times, uh, do different things throughout our life. And, um, and we have to look, I had to learn computers, right? Word processors, which I had to learn. They were gone. And today now I'm learning more about internet and social media. I mean, and that's changed so much since, you know, I first got on with AOL and CompuServe back in the nineties. So, 
You know, I mean, this idea that, that, you know, there's a fixed body of knowledge that you're going to learn. And once you've mastered it, you can get the job of your choice. It's nonsense. You know, it never has been true. But, um, uh, so, uh, sometimes it's a bit, uh, double edged sword, uh, this thing, because, uh, let's say the, the parents doesn't have the fundamental understanding of learning of this learning that you are mm-hmm. describing and they are putting the kids uh, in the homeschooling through more hell than the school mm-hmm. w- was going to take oh, yeah. them mm-hmm. so uh, <laughs> right well you know that's i mean that's the problem uh with life is like not everyone is nice <laughs> you know i mean it, you know it's, that's true. I mean, here it doesn't take. There's this book called "Educated" by Tara Westover that came out, which talks about you know being raised or, or dad was bipolar and, and you know very very much a, a messianic uh, individual. Um, and you know, uh, it, it was it's difficult re- reading, but she winds up very successful in her life despite that. But that's because she was became self aware enough. As did some of her siblings. She gave her a very large family. I forget five or six kids. Uh, I think one or two of her older brothers uh, left the family early and were able to get out. But uh, her, hers was quite a story and educated. So yeah, I, I, have no, I have no illusions, and I met I've, I've met many families like that that you know want to run their homes like military academies. But you know what? They, they're military academies for young kids too. <laughs> you know, they're not doing anything that they that if you have the money. You, you, you couldn't do, you know. So this idea that somehow homeschoolers are just innately, you know, some of homeschoolers are innately mean people, you know. Well, yeah, that's true, but they're also the, the, that sort of pretty people that run schools, as as we well know, you know, or gymnastics academies and stuff like that. A lot of uh, people that uh, I speak with, and I would talk about this topic, they mention always one thing. But uh, if my kids uh, want to go to university, how they will go if they don't go to school? And yeah. I'm curious to hear your answer to that. Well, again, I don't know what it's like in Greece, but um, in the United States, that was always a big question, right? And homeschoolers and unschoolers in particular have been getting into college. In 1981, when I um, started work at Holt Associates, there was a family in California called the Colfax family and their son Grant was, they homeschooled all four of their boys and uh, actually other school them in a dairy, dairy goat farm in Northern California. And, um, their oldest son Grant, uh, got into Harvard and it was so unusual in 1981. It was like, you know, the magazine had only been published for four years at that point, you know, and people were saying, it's, as, as you did, like, how are they going to get into college? And, and Holt had many, not many, but had stories, you know, actual, you know, printed, you know, documented people who were like from the fifties and sixties who didn't have high school degrees or homeschooled or, or alternatively educated and got into prestigious or, or state colleges, you know, so, so there was a, a, a small track record there, but then Grant got into Harvard and he had the, and, and, he did it on the, on the basis of his work with the dairy goats. He knew more about dairy goats than his parents did, and he wrote papers about it. And, and uh, he got pu- that that got published in, in various journals and stuff. And so when he applied to Harvard, he wanted to get in their pre med program, I believe, and they accepted him because he knew more about you know biology and stuff than than ninety percent of the people that they were admitted. And um, there was a magazine, I think it's still around, called the National Enquirer. It's kind of a, a gossipy sort of rag, <laughs> but very popular here. And uh, they had the headline about, uh, about um, it, because it was so unusual that a homeschooled child would get into Harvard. Their headline went, read, Ghost Boy Gets Into Harvard. <laughs> and, and, and I forgot this, but... Johnny Carson, who, who uh, had the Late Show, you know, one of our late, like right now, the equivalent would be Stephen Colbert or um, Jimmy Kimmel, you know, uh, these American late night talk show hosts. 
he had Grant on his, his TV shows. It was so unusual. And now I can't tell you. I've had, you know, two of my three daughters graduated college. They got in with, without difficulty because you're able to show a transcript of their work. They have recommendations and they, they go on the interview. They, they want to know, like, what are you going to contribute to our, our school? What sort of person are you? And they find out that you're the sort of person like social, you're, you're active in, in, in various things and involved in your community. That means as much, if not more, than getting, you know, being what they call a standard good grade, a standard student, you know. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that, that has helped them. And then now over the years, I mean, we published a book. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember the title. Um, College Admissions for Homeschoolers. I think there's actually several books that, about that, like that, that are out now. And it has been. So yeah, th- there's a lot of resources for getting into college. But again, I know that it's, it, you know, maybe, maybe America is a little looser with its credentials, although it doesn't feel that way. But uh, I, I'm sure that um, there are, oh, they have to be some alternative routes. And if there aren't in, in college, in some of the colleges, keep looking because there, there are, you know, there's a variety of different colleges, just like there are a variety of different schools. But, you know, if you want to be a heart set on becoming a pre med student and you want to go to a good school, you can still do that, you know, with, with a old schooling background, but you have to, to document, you have to show that you've got the chops to go into the school. And by that, it's that just that good grades. You know, it's not just good like, grades. Like, you need to show a portfolio of the stuff that you did. So, uh, like a, a resume of your. So, uh, start building some stuff that will show that you are interested. Yes. Exactly on the fee on the field, right? It's it, it, uh, another question that people that I discuss this have uh, is, well, great. If I had time, I was going to homeschool my right. kids, but unfortunately, I'm uh, from na- day until night uh, to my work, and I don't right. have time. So. Mm-hmm. What you suggest for those people that they're not that fortunate like you and your wife to have? Well, I mean, we took Sarah. And look, when we worked from home. We don't have a, a ton of money because, you know, we want to be with our kids, you know. And so we knew that, you know, that, that there's a trade-off, you know. And I also know wealthy families who homeschool. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. But for, for those who um, can't, I urge them to, to find a school that, that does match, uh, or, or, or you know, their style. Um, you know, maybe Montessori and stuff like that. But, you know, still you've got your requirements and, and whatnot for those, those schools. Um, but you, you can find something that's more in keeping with your values and or your child's interests. You know, um, I know a lot of kids are involved in computers and, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities with maker spaces and stuff like that. Um, the, the thing is finding opportunities for your, your children, you know, so that you can work, you know, I mean, th- that's what happens. I mean, my wife and I would trade off, you know, um, and then, um, if you're a single parent, that's particularly hard, but usually that's where grandparents and other families come in and say like, oh, okay, my, my, my daughter or son will play over at your house or, or be with your kids. You know, this day and then I'll, I'll take them on the weekend when I'm not working and stuff like that. So, the, the, you know, it, does, it involves a lot of, a lot of negotiation trade offs, but it, it, you know, I, it can be done. But again, that, that's one of the reasons why only 4% of the population does it because our society is not set up to accommodate children during the day other than putting them in daycare or schools. I can't, I mean, it's not that common anymore, but when we first started homeschooling in the late eighties, People will always say, why isn't she in school? And they you know, made the grocery store with us. So she'd be at the park with us or something, you know? And I was like, well, we're old schooling. And they were shocked. Like, What's that? Isn't that illegal? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want now, so from uh, this, uh, all the time in this uh, podcast, I was kind of asking you questions, but now I want to join forces and support some of your arguments. And I want to work with you to find some solutions because I I consider myself 
not expert in the topic, but experience in the topic. <laughs> so uh, I went to school in Cyprus. I, in the, my language is Greece uh, and Greek that I speak. Uh, Cyprus is a very small country that nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I... <laughs> I didn't, uh, I hated learning in school because it was forced to me. Mm. And now after uh, I left from school, I kind of discovered that this, this learning thing, understanding the world, discussing these topics, philosophical topics, scientist topic is the mo uh, history. Like I, I hated history and now I've, I fell in love with this stuff because yeah. I, I just learned them by myself. I watch podcasts. I discuss them with people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's uh, so much big difference, like to be self-motivated to learn something and something to be uh, forced upon you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, I think schools are, are a criminal uh, thing because they are, they are, making you hate learning therefore so well, and like you leave school and you never forget that you hate math uh, that you hate uh, science because not everyone is lucky like I, me to rediscover that these things are beautiful and learning is beautiful and it's like a putting the puzzle of learning is actually the most sexy interesting thing uh, ever so uh Yes, uh, personally, I, I had uh, this experience and, but now I, I want, uh, let's, let's work together and find what's, what should be the solutions for the future. So, uh, do you know Peter Gray? Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I had him on the podcast. I went to his house. He, he's an amazing uh, old individual. He's very cool. And we started talking about like, how, what's the solution to this stuff? And he was, uh, mentioning that, uh, there is a lot of solutions. And he said some, some cool things about let's, Let's not build schools. Let's build libraries that the kids, uh, cool hey. libraries that the kids can go and spend their time and spend their time in computers or gather together and brainstorm or go and the library will have, I don't know, a studio so people can film videos or something. Yes. So what, what are the futuristic solutions to this problem? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I completely agree with with uh, Peter. In fact, Holt and uh, John Gatto, many many sort of educators over the years, have said the library model no one forces you to invent stuff. Maybe a teacher on a school library, no <laughs> one forces you to, to take a book out. You know, you want to go into a stack and you say, "Oh, that's interesting," or "What's that about?" You know, and, and yeah, so I, I love that model. I also think that you know the ideas of public spaces. You know, we, we need to have more public spaces, uh, where, where people can, can gather for you know, sports. I think kids like to play games, you know, tag and stuff like that. Why, why, why do we only make them do it like during recess, you know, <laughs> in school and even recess and we cut recess out in America, you know, because they need more learning time, you know? So, so public spaces, you mean like there is a place that, uh, they like the park or something that yeah, someone yeah. can watch, like, like, uh, but maybe a bit more organized so people not, are not yeah. afraid to leave their children or go Wait. there. To... Right. There was a, a part in, um, I think it was in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and a friend of mine, Yuda Mason, she, she wrote about this years ago, <laughs> but they used to, she, she did sewing. So she and her colleagues like to sew in the park. So they would bring their, some of them bought sewing machines. And that's what got them in trouble with the authorities. <laughs> but they were sewing in the park. And next thing you know, children and other adults, what are you doing? Oh, can I see you? Can I try? You know? And if that wasn't their intent. They just wanted to be outdoors sewing and talking with one another. But it grew into that. And, and you know, the authorities shut it down. You, know, you can't do sewing in the park. So that was, you know, 
why? The length of the parade. <laughs> like, so, so you know, a lot of it is gen- It's just this idea that you know, kids should be seen and not heard. They, they just belong in school, and learning should only be done by. Uh, I mean, teaching should only be done by certified teachers. You know, in school, not like people who who are just so. You know, okay, and that's crazy. You know, I mean, it's like saying you can't teach your kid to cook unless you went to culinary school. You know, or to read. I know how to read. I could teach you to read. You know, but no, 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 no. you're not a professional. You know, and, and there's this, this, you know, this, this, huh. this idea, yeah. you know. But, you, know I, uh, <laughs> pro, you are not a professional. <laughs> it's like most of my teachers, they were scums. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I watched some of your stunts. So yeah, I don't I can imagine how you learn to get buried alive and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to 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 think that uh, you are not qualified, like there is so many underqualified teachers. Like uh, just a grandma that is she's 60 year old that she doesn't have any idea about the internet. And it's like she's teaching you stuff. It's like I recall a lot of times in when I, I was a student, that uh, that what the teacher was saying was not making sense to me, and I was googling why I was searching while they were talking, and, <laughs> and the, uh, I was calling them out. And the, it was is uh, I, I felt that th- this is a, a feeling that I have because I spent some time with young children, uh, 15, 14, 16, and they, I think they. If they are not yet, they are on the trajectory to, on average, to be a lot more uh, clever than the teachers yeah. that they teach them. So what clever means, let's define clever. Clever is, for me, is how your ability to predict the future better. Uh, well, we- so... Uh, the kids that are living in social media, they know uh, they see uh, scientific videos now on TikTok and they understand about science. They see everything. So, uh, and they, <laughs> they are going to become a lot more clever than their teacher. And I think they are already. So, so it's very funny to have the stupid one teaching the clever one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, there, there. You know, there's there's a lot that that we forget. You know, uh, I, I just love that that, that example of looking at Google. <laughs> You're in the classroom, but probably they got to see if the teacher is correct. Um, yeah, and and, and there, you know, the schools. Are, I mean, look, they they're all. I, I think now they allow cell phones. They wouldn't even let cell phones in, in the classroom for many years. No, they don't allow. Uh, uh, in my oh, country, uh, they, 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 will ha- they put a box and put your phone inside them, some oh, teachers. That, right, right. So we, it's, you know, it's yeah, everyone's got to be focused on the teacher. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, like, again, if it was voluntary, they would have kids. Because I know, I mean, everyone at some point, you know, wants to learn and, you know, and there's only, you know, there are limits to that, 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 that you have with self teaching too. You know, I mean, someone, you know, sure, Googling and go around the internet, but having someone who could say, Oh, don't waste your time going to those sites here. Go, go talk to these two people or go to this site. You know, that can save you a bunch of time and effort. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely a role for teachers, but it, it, you know, their role is just become like admin, uh, administers of the curriculum. You know, and, and, you know, and, and marching the kids through the stuff. I mean, I, in the States right now, I keep reading in, in education week and so on. Our kids are, because of the pandemic, four months behind, four months behind in learning. It's going to take years for them to catch up. And it's, that's crazy. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I've seen, you know, people who need to, to learn something, learn it a lot quicker than the school does because of as you said earlier, so let's say I make you now a president of the United States, and <laughs> you have you have absolute power. Forget that the parties will not allow you or all this. You have absolute power to change whatever you want in the school system and make it how you want it to be, or create libraries, or create like how do you how do you 
go about it. Walk me step by step. All with right. Well, I, closing schools and making them different or well, whatever. All right. Well, the, I would say I would have to get buy in on the idea that education is not just instruction. That's the first one, and that we would do a lot better by our children and education by giving, you know, ma making children's lives and families' lives easier so that, you know, they're not worried about paying bills, you know, for, you know, for water and food. I'm not talking about, in, you know, extraneous things, uh, you know, you know, so the, you know, getting the basic social safety net under there so that, you know, I mean, a kid can, you know, can have the best teachers in the world, but if they got to go home to a, a horrible situation, you know, uh, that, 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 that learning is almost becomes meaningless, you know? So I, I, I think we have to view education widely, you know, and not narrowly as just instruction. So I would say that, you know, if we help, you know, you know, children stay healthy, and families stay, you know, stay, you know, solid enough that, you know, their families, that, that they, they know that they're not going to get thrown out and that, that there's some stability. I mean, insecure children will learn. I mean, if, if you've got difficulty, if I have difficulty in my life, I, I don't learn well. I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed like with, with whatever the problem is I'm facing or, you know, what I'm dealing with. And the same is true for children and, and people overall. So this whole idea that, I would get rid of the whole idea that school is run on a schedule. You know, we don't learn on a schedule. We do, but the schedule is our own. It's unique you know, to our circumstances. So I would really, really emphasize, you know, first of all, fixing, you know, the, the, I don't, I don't think this is so true in, in, in um, Europe as much as it is in America, but fixing the social safety net, really making sure that kids have a safe place to be in the parents feel that, that they're supported in, in, you know, if, if we really meant that, that we want, you know, families to thrive, let's make it so, you know, I mean, you know, many of us are just like one medical bill away from bankruptcy, you know, I mean, this is a weird, a weird part in, in state. I mean, the, the income inequality and, uh, and all these other issues really do weigh in on, on education. So, you know, to, to just think like, oh, yeah, we can, here's education and here's the social issues. You know, we'll just focus on education so we have smart people to fix the social issues. That hasn't happened. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, we've had the best and the brightest, you know, since at least the 1960s. There are all the Harvard and Yale Ivy League school graduates running our country, running our state governments. Hey, look at us. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, we're, we're on a point where we're like, we're, 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 we're losing our sense of democracy and, and, and pluralism, you know, and school's supposed to be teaching that. Now they're telling us, nah, school shouldn't be teaching civics. You know, they, you know, they, they shouldn't be teaching that, that, you know, the history of your country, unless it's the approved history of the whole country, you know? So yeah, I, I think socially there's a lot there. And then, yeah, but, but practically, like, I think one thing I would do would, would be to make, as I said, that the funding for schools is based on the students in their school district and the schools should get that money. I don't, you know, I mean, people talk about vouchers, but then that's just another way of, of siphoning the money towards those who will, you know, can afford it. You know, or to, to, to create a private school to, or want to send their, their kids there. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I mean, that's always going to exist. I mean, I mean, every society has private schools, you know, elite schools. So, I, I, you know, um, but the, the idea that they're the only ones that produce smart people or the smartest people, it's nonsense. You know, some of the smartest people, you know, we, we know, uh, you know, didn't graduate college. Harry S. Truman, one of our great presidents, he never graduated college, <laughs> you know? So, you know, the idea that, 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 that we have to march people through. And then I would make school life well that, you know, you can go in and out. I wouldn't make it a four year sentence. I wouldn't make it an eight year sentence. I'd make it that throughout your life, you go in and learn. You want to learn to, to speak Spanish when you're 40? 
here's, you know, you can take the classes here. You know, there's, there's Spanish classes being offered in this. Very important. With the children, with diverse age, this uh, thing that we divide children by their age and we only put 15 years old with 15 yeah. years old, it's a, again a crime. Like yes. the most learning that I get, got in my life is or hanging out with very young people to understand the technology because they know it better than me or when I hang out with uh, all very older people than me because they have different kind of experience. So because the people in my age generally will have similar knowledges about stuff. So you are, you are, you are fucking the whole learning process when you put uh, people in the same age together. That's right. That's right. That's why I offer, you know, when I talk about socialization, you know, and, and fortunately there's less and less of that now. I mean, people are seeing the fruits of, of homeschooling that, you know, children are not unsocialized feral beasts, you know, just because they didn't go to school. But the idea that your peers or your age needs is ridiculous. Your peers are the people who are interested or want to share their interests with you. You know, so yeah, that could be a bunch of kids playing the Nintendo Switch, or it could be a, a kid like a, for me, music and magic were, were, were real motivators. And in both those fields, you know, older people welcome younger people, and they don't have a problem. They don't care if you're ten years old. If you can play Beethoven's and you know, Pepetik Sonata, they're going to talk to you. You know, if I could see someone produce, you know, a deck of cards and, you know, one by one out of their hand, I'm going to say, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I don't care if they're five. <laughs> no. Yes. Steve Jobs has a famous story that uh, he, he, ju- he wanted some uh, computer parts or something to, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but, uh, he called, uh, he found the phone book and he called the CEO of Hulal Pager back then when he was 12. <laughs> uh, and, and he asked him, uh, I want these parts. Uh, and it was very strange because uh, this 12 year old is calling me to, 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 but he gave him the parts and not only he gave him the parts, he gave him, uh, uh, a, a job for a summer in Hewlett Packard, and that uh, Steve Jobs says that it played so much big role on his education that uh, mm-hmm. that famous person or he went to work uh, and he made a processor or something like that. So yes, the uh, the the thing that twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen year old people like they don't worth opportunities until they are 18 or 19 Mm -hmm. or they are 23 it's uh, completely nonsense it is it is and you know school yeah it it, it has been used yeah to 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 keep children out of the workforce you know which is fine i don't i'm I'm not into into child labor i'm not saying they like you know they should work in mines and stuff but you know only if they want to uh, well unsafe work yeah, I, I don't think even adults shouldn't be doing it. Should be doing unsafe work. You know, yeah, if it could be safe, you you can you know, invite the children to to help you. And and there are so many, so many opportunities. You know, but we forget about the simple ones. You know, helping around the house, cooking. You know, uh, my gosh, you can learn you know, science and math, everything from cooking. You know, but you know, we think, oh no, you only learn math from a textbook. Or an abacus or, or a computer. Like, no, well, you can use it, you know, from grandma in a measuring cup of tablespoons. You can figure that out. <laughs> so uh I'm I'm a, I'm I'm thinking a bit about the future of education now with artificial intelligence that is taking over. Like I think do you think that teachers will be irrelevant if we have the um, the most knowledgeable a machine ever a creator with all the human knowledge combined and much more to teach a person uh, do you think a school or teaching will change fundamentally there that's an interesting question i hadn't thought of that um you know i i think you're right that that there could be a point if if all if all a teacher is is the answer giver right just the answer giver then yes 
they are absolutely in danger of losing their job <laughs> to artificial intelligence. Absolutely. And that's why we have to get past this idea that it's just brain smarts. You know, ju just being able to say the right answer means that you're an intelligent person. You know, you have to have social awareness. You have to have emotional awareness. You know, you have, you have to have environmental awareness. Yeah, you know, you, as you know, entertainers say, you have to know how to read the room. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, computer, I'm, I'm sure some scientists, oh yeah, we'll put sensors in the room and all of that. Some feedback to the AI device that'll let them know that they're, they're, they're following the argument or whatnot. It's like, well, look, I know if someone's interested because they're looking at me or they're taking notes or they're nodding their head. You know, I don't, I don't need to put sensors in the room. <laughs> you know, and uh, and and the, the, but the, the the cool thing here is you don't need to put sensors in the room. People have already sensors on them. It's a watch, uh, a oh. ring or something. Oh, Apple you're watch. right. We're, 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 you're absolutely we're becoming more attached uh, that way. Yes, and and then like you, it's uh, I'm actually honest, and it's crazy. Like imagine if you know exactly the biochemistry or the blood pressure of a human all the time that you are giving him learning. Like that will, uh, if he's sleeping, if you need to re-engage him because he's tired, it's like you will know everything. The machine will know everything. So it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's it's very interesting. I, I you, know, you reminded me of a, an article I read in uh, one of these education publications going back maybe about five, 10 years. But they were describing how the, how uh, computers are going to change society because they're, they're going to have have the ability to a student walks underneath like like um it's like an airport terminal you know the metal detector but it's the sensors in there can tell the the administrators the mood their blood sugar levels their heart rate all that stuff and then based on that they'll be assigned to a particular classroom and teacher and you know. That to me is that it's just like like treating kids as products on a conveyor belt. You know, it's like no, we're humans. Yeah, we have emotions, but like like you said, our sensors will let us know. You know, if we're if if we use them, a lot of people dull their sensors or don't even want to use them. You know, but good teachers always know this one students engage, this one isn't, this one yeah you know, needs more help. You know. And, and that, and, and that's fine. We have to trust our human impulses much more than, than, than we do. And I think school, unfortunately, you know, colludes with, with, um, well, what would that colludes with technology to make us doubt our senses, right? Like you can't teach someone to read unless you understand all this stuff. And I remember a common comment and maybe it still comes up, but I don't hear it as much as I did in the eighties and nineties. Well, this homeschooling thing, especially unschooling, where you're not even following the curriculum, oh boy, I mean, you're just experimenting with your children. And I and I was like, schools are spreading your, our, our kids every day. In America, just like in the last two years, they found out that the, the, the reading program they've been using in the schools for 20 years isn't giving the results. In fact, it's, 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 it's dulling children's abilities to read, right? So, and and. and it's so many examples of the schools, like trying the latest fad, the latest this, and, and here we are talking about technology and, and, you know, God, how many of the, uh, computer programs and, and computer, you know, Google giving Chrome and Apple giving their MacBooks and all this. Come on. I mean, it's, it's so self-serving. I mean, you know, you know, that's not how education works. It always boils down to people, you know, in, in an environment, not like someone plugged into the internet. Or just plugged into whatever sensor they have. That's why I really like, you know, I'm, I'm shocked at like how, you know, the race for, um, a virtual reality. Well, I mean, you, you did so well. You wore a virtual reality headset for 10 days. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how, how you could do that. You know? And they're talking about like, you know, you want to put kids in this to, to learn like for uh, even an hour a day. That would be disorienting, you know, so much. <laughs> And then talk about like not having control. You're not in control when you know when you're in there. It's whoever's got the inputs that's <laughs> control. You know, I don't know. It it it's interesting. I agree with you that it's dangerous, but I completely disagree with you because me, I am 
in immersed in the technologies and the new things and i can see i can see vividly uh that or artificial intelligence or even the the internet maybe kids don't even need any the, the any help now with learning and they don't need even schools they can find everything on the internet they can watch youtube videos and learn they can speak mm-hmm. with other people find their community on the internet and it's like i'm taking one step further like with artificial intelligence maybe it will be so much different the learning and like better in a lot of ways uh but uh but the problem becomes the, then in the future if all this stuff that i'm saying are true which uh, i probably am wrong but uh uh then becomes the question okay we just need a space to facilitate them without any teachers without anything just uh, a, a a space for them to for the parents to leave them there and go to their work so i, I don't know this is kind of the future i see well i would like to see more interaction because i think that you know I, to me the, the the great example of this is uh, Sugata Mitra and his hole in the wall experiment. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Well, yes. Right. I mean, that's a I love. Great... I, I I I love this. Yeah. This, uh, for right. people that they are not familiar, let's explain uh, explain very briefly what he did. Okay. Um. So, Mitra uh, Sugata Mitra was an engineer, and he was curious to know um if. You know how children in 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 India, in rural India, uh, if you know how children would respond to the internet because he, that they didn't have it, and so he he put a computer in a wall in in, in the village, and a mouse and a keyboard, and were attached to it, and he just he put a video camera up to, to observe how the kids used it, and over time he found that it wasn't you know. And again, this is what, what, what I mean by, by the social aspect of it. It wasn't just one kid going up and using a computer. It was several of them at a time. And they'd all start giving pointers to each other. Well, oh, here, try this. Try. They figured out how to use the internet. And then further, they learned English because so much of the internet is in English. And they figured that out just amongst themselves. How to, how, you know, without. Any teacher, no, without one any adult. teacher. That's right. Now, one adult is present, and this is, yeah, he won a uh, million dollar TED prize, and now he's running a school in England. And, you know, I, mean, I heard him speak in America a few years ago, but um, he's not nearly as popular as he was. And I think that, that that's a great example. But see, again, it's not like, you know, this isolated person, you know, certain, I mean, that's the model we have, you know. Just teaching of self program. I mean, I like the idea that it was the, the group, the kids come together voluntarily, yeah, and then really stick uh, with it because they were in uh, the, and the uh, and the way that they learned that in the experience was very funny. Like the some kids, uh, it it was like a gathering, like oh this 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 this, and it's like this what? is the natural, and the other person that figured things out, he's teaching the new guy, and then they are the other guy that spend more time there, and they are, it's like a, a collective ro- group that it becomes more intelligent together. They discover the internet mm-hmm. together, yeah. and how do you re- replicate that? You know, I mean, you, you just you, we have to trust the children. We have to. Give them access to the world, as John Alt always said. They need access to us and the world. You know, instead, we're like, oh, you're five years old. You can only have access to these teachers, and I'll see you at five o'clock. You know, and, and that's and, and you know, and, and that's for families that are most of, like I said, change is incremental. You know, but I think as more and more people understand that children are actually born natural learners. And that we kind of destroy, as you said earlier, that you know, we smother that learning with too much control. You know? But the more we can free that up, the more uh, p- people see it, that to me is, is the hope for education. And that's why I'm so, so thrilled that you know, uh, homeschooling and unschooling is growing. You know? I mean, and it's incremental, but I, I never had illusions that I was going to become a billionaire writing, <laughs> selling books about homeschooling. <laughs> but, it's, uh, you know, but, but to me, it's a meaningful way to spend my life because I really feel that 
tell, that people need to recognize, whether whether they're you know uh, poor or, or wealthy, that they have the ability to learn and grow. That it doesn't stop until we die. So don't give up. Yes, this is very important that you said, like because learn people think learning stops after you uh, you go to university and like this is a condition that people have and they are stopping their themselves like uh, disease and they're sto- when you believe that you stop learning or is, oh people learn uh, yeah everything that you learn you learn until 23 or what? everything that you learn you learn until 18 or everything you learn you learn until 5 or whatever there is a lot of stories about that but I don't know. I, I if you don't limit yourself with learning, you can be. I have my best friend is my high school teacher that teach me physics when he uh, in school, and like he is fifty five years old and le- he's learning as passionately as me about everything, and he's getting new information. So it's lifelong learning and not limiting yourself. That's right. It's very important. lifelong learning. That's right. But you know. Like I said, you know, we're just so hung up on, on buying our education, packaging it to a credential. Hey, I'm educated. Here's my degree. <laughs> you know, I mean, businesses would be, and, and they, and they did during the pandemic. They had to like give up looking at degrees and said, you know, because they, they couldn't hire enough people. And then they found out that a lot of the people that were hiring without degrees did the job just fine. And, and I write this in, uh, teach your own, but uh, it's something I heard John Holt say many, many times. Most college graduates are underemployed, meaning that they can, the work they're doing could be done by someone with a high school degree. 43% of college graduates in New York State, according to the Federal Reserve, are underemployed by that definition. Their work could easily be done by high school graduates. So, and, and, and who will drive this behavior? The employers and the employers don't care. Uh, uh, if you uh, will not care in the future as well because they will see people without school they were more productive because they care about outcome or, uh, mm-hmm. or not about the uh, the status so uh the 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 business man will drive this behavior and you see already Elon Musk talk multiple times that you don't need uh, a degree to join Tesla or his companies. Mm-hmm. You just need to prove that you did cool stuff. And me, I find it, I, mm-hmm. I employ people as well. And I find it, uh, I prefer to hire people without uh, uh, high school, without, the, uh, without um, university degrees because it shows that they are thinking outside the box, um, they are more likely to think outside the box mm. than the people that they went to the university. Right. So it's like for now, it's rever- like maybe I'm a bit crazy or something, but I, I think that things will change and like, uh, and it will not, it will be probably a bug, not a feature to go to university or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's that's slowly changing because of the computers, you know. I mean, people can, you know, self-taught themselves like Steve Jobs, right? I mean, it, it's filled with it. And, of course, like people like Jobs and Bill Gates you know, and Mark Zuckerberg, well, even Tesla, they feel like they're exceptions. You know, they didn't need college degrees. I, mean, well, I don't know about Tesla. Um, Musk, maybe he does. But I know that um, Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard and, and uh, Gates and, and Jobs and and but they often when when I've read interviews with them, they often think that yeah, well, I you know it's because the time is special. That's why I could do it. I'm not sure that's what everyone could do. And I was like, no, everyone could do. It. <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah, you you are special. I'm not trying to say that that you're not a genius or whatever or somewhat, but you don't need yeah, you, know, you don't need that extra degree. And that's why like a, a lot of computer people not get certificates, six month or one year program. You know, just to show I can program in such and such a language or do this this task. You know, and it, that's that's the future. I feel you know, it's like because we can learn so many things through the computer, through other uh, institutions. I mean, you know, there are. I mean, you know, as we said earlier, you know, there's more camps, there's more businesses, maker spaces, libraries slowly expand. Because the credentialism is still very strong, strong in education. 
I will give you an example. Tell me if I'm crazy or something. But uh, <laughs> which one is better person to learn business from? There is th- uh, there is hundreds of podcasts of Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, the best uh, Steve Jobs, the best businessman in the world, and you can see them teaching and telling their experience with business or to go to business school. Like this, this was so idiotic for me. Like it was so obvious for me. That's why I didn't go to, to university and I knew that I liked business and stuff. So I was like, I have the cleverest person in the industry teaching me this stuff for free and I'm going to go and pay or do spend yeah. time with just a professor that read a book about this or read multiple books about and right. so it didn't make any sense for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then to, to build on that, I need to go back to a point you made earlier about um you know it's you know about about learning all the time, uh, which is the title of one of Holt's books. But uh, I want to refer to another book of his called Never Too Late. And in it um it's it's his musical autobiography. And in it he talks about how at the age of 40 he picked up the cello. He wanted to learn to play the cello, and and it's and it's it, and it, it's a wonderful uh, book. Of, you know, because again, it talks about you know not only you know the you know, how he why he learned and the enjoyment he got from it, but how difficult it was, and it put him in a learner's seat again. And it, and it, and then talking about some of the teachers and trying to find a teacher that that he enjoyed working with. You know, so you know the, the idea that. Everything is fixed and done when you get your college degrees. Nonsense. Well, there's, there's all. It's never too late to learn. You, know, you can. Well, well, that's that's a really important thing that uh, we forget. We we think that only young people can come up. You know, young scientists, young businessmen. Like no, I mean they're there, but it, it's the whole spectrum. It's just that the media and um, our culture tends to focus on the people who get you know the most attention, and usually like you know. I don't care. Yeah, like the older you get, the less you care about the attention. The more I feel, the more you care about the work. You know, just just enjoying life and having a good life. You know, but uh, I ask every guest on this podcast. I give you one trillion dollars. How do you spend it to have maximum impact in the world? Wow. All right. Um. Well, I mean, that's not enough money to, to help the social safety net and, and, uh, and, and so on. But I think I would, I would invest it in, uh, creating, uh, some sort of public library or, um, maybe not, yeah, I mean, a library, it, it kind of means books, but and I'm thinking more activities too. I mean, you know, but some sort of, um, you know, I wouldn't even want to call it a learning center. Just, you know, um, like a con- kind of like like the the concept of a work of uh, a communal workspace, but it's it it would be like if you it would be where where like you would also be able to to create things there like food or um sewing or doing, like like where people are doing things and inviting others to join them and that it would be. A daily thing, something that people can count on. Children would be welcome. Actually, another way that I would spend the money too would be a campaign, you know, to to make children more welcome in society, uh, so that people start to recognize that that you know, children are actually you know people that, that should have rights that should be treated with respect, not just you know sit down, shut up, and do as I say, which is you know our our entire culture's attitude towards kids. So again, you know, that might be another way to do it. Like if, if, if I could find a good, a good advertising person, like, you know, that like would know how to start, start to twist, twist the, uh, the narrative around from, you know, this idea of the dominator paradigm of, you know, the adults controlling kids to more of a partnership paradigm, you know, not where the kids control you, but where, you know, you agree and if you've got more experience. So look, the kids want to climb up to the top of the telephone pole and jump off. Tell them no. <laughs> no. I don't think that's a good idea. But why do you want to go up high like that? Maybe we can find you know, a tree or something safer. You know, we, we can work these things out. 
instead of, no, that's a dumb idea. And then that's it. Or just saying no, <laughs> which is probably the more common response. <laughs> You know, so yeah, uh, that, that's an interesting, an interesting question. You know, how would I spend that? And so those are a couple of ideas. Then another one, you know, I mean, I mean, like, you know, I would, I would maybe just do magic or, or music, you know, uh, and, and, you know, create like a, a traveling, uh, like a van or a truck or something that, that would go to place to place and introduce children to these things and, and teach them. You know, so that, you know, the idea that you have to go to the school, you know, the, the, the great convenience of the computer as the school comes to you. Well, with cars and stuff, you know, we could do the same thing, particularly in underserved neighborhoods and rural areas, you know. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like this all year round thing, you know, a, a week, you know, and, and then you come back. I mean, people forget that, you know, education wasn't this all encompassing thing, you know. Um, Back in the day, you know, Shakespeare's time, you know, they were lucky to get uh, traveling uh, teachers, you know. Uh, same thing in America, uh, the, sleep, the legend of Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman story. Ichabod Crane is a, you know, the, the main character there is a traveling school teacher. Six weeks. That was it. Six weeks out of the year, the village kids would get, you know, taught read, you know, and, and then and so on. But, you know, instead we've, stretched that out reading is now like a multi-year process and math is you know, everything is you know got to be like this 12-year program or as a uh, one uh, education writer put it a 12-year sentence do, do you think that children should vote say that again do you think that children should be allowed to vote oh yeah Absolutely. I mean, people, people think, oh, and this is, I know, John Holt wrote a book called Escape from Childhood, uh, where he just says, you know, in order for, for kids to, to be treated well and, and set as disposable, um, well, let's give them the same rights adults have under the U.S. Constitution. And so he outlines in this book each one of those, those rights. Uh, and one of them, of course, is the right to vote. And in it, the right to have sex, the right to, no one argued with that stuff. It was the right to vote that upset the most people and still does. Yeah. How can you say that a six year old should, well, first of all, there should be some, they should be able to read so they could yeah, prove that they could read the names on there or, or, or we can read them to them, but that they, they're aware of the situation, but we don't request that of adults, you know? So, you know, like maybe even that's what's the, What's the age you think? 10, 8, 12, 15? Oh, I, I think it's when they're, when, you know, I think it would be when they're ready. I know some 10 year olds that are completely uh, up to date on their politics. You know, and typically it's because their parents tend to be too. But um, I also know 10 year olds who are completely oblivious to politics. So I, I really would say. So, that so maybe they will do a test, like a driving test, if they are ready or something. Well, you know, I thought a lot, but it, we don't do that for voting. Voting is just, you know, you're born a citizen. You're, you're, we put an age limit on it, which is 18 in America. But, you know, I mean, you're right. You're affected too. You know, the kids are affected too by this, you know. So I, I would, I would personally not have any problem with it. Um, we would have to figure out certain implementation issues, but I think as an idea, it's valid. And and the more votes that that, that we have, I mean, people are worried. You know, the kids would be influenced by their parents, and most likely, those folks would tend to vote like their parents. But I don't know. As time goes on, as the kids get older, their opinions change. I don't mind it. My kids' opinions have changed. You know, uh, you know, so. I'm not that worried. And with, and with the argument that I gave you, uh, that I think people are becoming cleverer than uh, adults. Yeah. <laughs> Might be the, the wise solution to give them the power. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and like, my gosh, you know, I mean, why don't we listen to kids' opinions about school? I mean, it's very basic. I mean, I don't know talk about voting, but, but we don't even want to hear their opinions about school. You know, when they say they're bored, we say tough. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, from from 
overall our conversation, some things that I drew is like, uh, how important is to treat, uh, kids like adults mm-hmm. to give them responsibilities, to give them, to not treat them like the, to not see them from above yeah. and to see them as equals. So uh, very interesting. In, in his book, Escape from Childhood about children, the needs and rights of children, there's a, or a quote in there that I've always liked. And that is, it's not how, what, what or how we teach children that determines what sort, what sort of adult they become. It's how we treat children. You know, it's funny that it's a, so I was discussing with one, my teacher and we were saying that he was saying that sometimes, um, just putting a person to think that that's their job. For example, if I, if I convince you now to come to my position and become a YouTuber, so, and like you are, you believe it and like you come and like you act like a YouTuber because of the environment that I have, because of everything, you're going to be a very good uh, YouTuber because I'm treating you like, people will be treating you like a YouTuber. Your identity will be like a YouTuber. So the same thing with children, when we don't treat them as equals and we treat them as down, uh, they they act like they are uh, less of something in comparison to equals. So how you treat a person is, how his behavior is emerging, I think. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, for last question, what do you want to leave behind in this world? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy uh, that I have three daughters who are adults now and I um, hope that we have grandchildren. So, you know, that, that would be nice to, uh-huh. Um, in terms of leaving things behind, I, I hope that, you know, the, the magazine uh, lives on. Um, er, I, I scanned and posted every single issue at a place called issue, issuu.com. And, uh, it's all free. We'll put the link in the description. Uh, well, we put, we put, we will put the link on the okay. description yeah, and also for it's, people it, to find it. Yeah. If you go to my website, johnholgws.com. Look under GWS archives, and that's the link that'll take you. You know, because right now I'm retyping everything. I drew well, volunteers have retyped everything, now laying them out. And, you know, I could show you. Here's the first volume. We're up on the fourth. You know, this is like, you know, a couple of pages from an issue. So you can imagine the original issues, <laughs> like that thing here. <laughs> Here's an original issue. And you could see, like, oh, you know, wow. small. The Titans, how, you know, I mean, they're, they're packed. You know, there's only 24 pages in these, but it is packed. And this is volume one. I'm laying out volume five, and I estimate I got six more volumes before I get everything. And this is a 600-page book, you know, just using 12-point type so it's easier for people to read. <laughs> I mean, this is... Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so I like to leave so this it's. Uh, so you are going to put all the stories of the people that they collect, you collected and put them in, That's in right. books for people to, to be inspired that I can do this as well That's for my right. kids. I, That's right. there is another example of this. So you want to, you want, uh, to try to promote as much as possible this, your ideas. Absolutely. You know, the idea that. You know, you don't have to go to school to grow. Now, that's why John called it growing without schooling. You know, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's a natural process. Learning is natural. You know, and, you know, let's not thwart it with all these, these concepts. I mean, you know, I mean, another concept, I mean, there's so many crazy ideas that, you know, like the idea that, um, left hand Catholic schools in particular in America, you know, if you roll with your left hand, they, they would stop you and force you to write with your right hand. <laughs> you know, why? You know, uh, you can imagine like the difficulties that cause people, you know, young children. But, um, you know, these, these ideas have lasted a long time. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad that some of them are going away. But the idea that children should 
be seen and not heard, that they should do nothing but obey their parents. And uh, of course, you know, you know that, that won't become much of an issue with your partners, you know, but if you're in constant, you know, power dynamics, and yeah, you know, you, you can get into that that uh, thing. So yeah, I don't know I'm kind of rambling right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say, Patrick Ferenga, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time. I love you. Thank you for your work that you are doing, and you believe it in so. Oh, much. It's so, so inspiring much. to see babies come into the world, extraordinarily curious, eager to learn, extraordinarily resourceful and competent at learning that they are, in the most literal sense of the word, scientists. They do exactly what scientists do. They, they use the scientific method in making sense of the world around them. And then they get to a certain age, which may be as young as three, but in any case, the age of school. And this process is turned off by adults who think they are now going to direct and control the learning of these children. Who They treat them like empty receptacles into which they are going to pour whatever learning they think they ought to have. The child's curiosity, the child's independence, the child's confidence in herself as, as a learner, as an explorer, as hell. School is a place where children learn to be stupid. And the process that makes them stupid, at least stupid in school, is other people trying to control their learning. I say, let school be a place in which children can continue to explore the world in the ways that are most interesting and productive from the, for them. Let us give them help if they ask for it, answer their questions, put, make accessible to them as much of the world and its materials and resources and skills and people as we can. But let's not try to decide how they are going to use that material. Let the, let the child make the curriculum.